Today I'm interviewing Raymond Kaminsky, an entrepreneur, a foodie, and a very thoughtful person. He started his career at NASA, eventually moving into finance at Honest Dollar, where I met him, before Honest Dollar was acquired by Goldman Sachs. Now he's the CEO of Ibble, a platform which began life educating traders and has since pivoted to become a video-based social media platform. Sometimes it does take a rocket scientist to solve the innumerable ethical issues with social media. We get into the uncomfortable issues with social and censorship, and I think we even managed to stay friends after it was all said and done. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy getting to know Raymond Kaminsky. Hello, Mr. Kaminsky. How are you? <laughs> Robert. <laughs> Good seeing you. Today I have with me Raymond Kaminsky, the CEO of Ibble. He's my premier interlocutor, and um, this is quite an endeavor, I think, for both of us. Um, but uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, Thank you for having me. <clears throat> well, I think there's a lot of really interesting reasons that we have to talk, um, and and historically have talked about. But um, unfortunately, most people don't get to see what we get to talk about. So this is kind of an interesting way to sort of open up and share a little bit about yeah, the kinds no, of conversations. No bourbon have. this time, so it's going to be like slightly <laughs> different. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I might have had some bourbon. You never know. <laughs> so. Uh, the couple of reasons just for the audience's sake that I think it would be useful to um, talk to you in particular, number one, we're friends and colleagues and, uh, we've known each other for quite a while and that's a good place to start. Uh, we have a common way of talking about things, which is good. Number two, this is your studio. Uh, and, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Ibble, um, probably a lot more in a little bit. Um, but also you, I don't know if you remember this, were the first person to encourage me to do a podcast. Do you remember that? I don't, but I really mm -hmm. appreciate you doing it. Yeah, uh, it actually took a while for me to fully grok how important that would be. Uh, so for a long time, I just kept it in the back burner and back of my head. And someday I might actually pull the trigger on it. And it, here we are. You know, uh, like, I think what's really important is there's so many great conversations that happen around the world. And um, it's a great way to document them. But I had a, a, one of my friends, Andy, actually tell me something that like something that magical happens when you're in the studio being around you know, like one of the oldest buildings in Austin and um, hearing your voice, it's like a dancer dancing in front of a mirror. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's amazing conversations that just flow. So in this room, so I'm excited you uh, decided to do it. And I'm really excited you decided to do it here. Yeah, I, I could not be happier that I was able to make this all work out. <clears throat> a lot went into this, um, as, uh, as I'm sure you have some idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. So I think... One of the major reasons, or probably the primary reason, I think that you are a great first guest, because this is a podcast, and podcasts we're talking, we're talking about things, and those things can be controversial, or they could be just totally banal. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that we are able to have these kinds of conversations. And as the CEO of Ibble, which is a brand new social media platform, and I'd love to get your take on how you describe it, so just for the audience's sake. Um, you get the benefit of hindsight. You get to see what happened with Facebook and Reddit and Twitter and all these different social media platforms that have been beleaguered by some First Amendment issues, um, whether it's truly First Amendment or people's perception of it. Um, I think censorship, whether it's government-sponsored censorship or just some social media company deciding what they want on their platform from a policy, from a trust and safety perspective or whatever, there is there is certainly a chilling effect that's happening and a lot of people are feeling it. And it's certainly front and center geopolitically and uh, just socially in general. So I'd like to start off by um, having this very first podcast be about censorship uh, and how that how you're going to affect uh, that change of all this uh, prior knowledge you've had from all these different social media platforms and how that's going to affect Ibble. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, the kind of... Uh unpack what you said mm -hmm. where when most of us go away to school um, high school college whatever it is um vocational school we're we're the time that we're in school is the same amount of uh time never changes high schools four years colleges four or five years vocational six months year two years and what happens is time is constantly changing and we're learning new things. And so what we have to do is we have to compress down a lot of knowledge in a, in a short amount of time. And so what's really good, what's happened with a lot of uh, social media platforms is, um, you know, we've, we've watched years unpack. We've, we've watched growth. We've watched mistakes happen. And um, 
what we get to do is watch from the sidelines and say, um, how do we how do we reinvent all this? How do we start fresh and uh, not be a, a platform focused on a feature, uh, but be a, a platform focused on uh, reinventing social media? And so it's been really exciting for us so far. So why don't you spend a few minutes telling us about Ibble <clears throat> and specifically kind of how you got here uh, from Ibble's perspective? Like, why Ibble? Why now? Um, actually, everything I've uh, ended up here, we didn't start as a, a social media platform. We started out as actually a, a finance app, but with the same uh, core knowledge. We we were focusing on education. And, uh, and I really thought it was going to be powerful to let people that are really intelligent about, about a subject matter um, share stuff that they're passionate about. So we started with publicly traded or even private companies of what people were really excited about and stopped when we were a finance app, stopped focusing on here's the graph and here's fundamentals and here's how it's trading a certain way and more what made a person excited about it. Because I think you can find anybody passionate about something and when they're passionate about something, it comes out of how they uh, speak about it. So we started with that core idea of uh, democratizing education, making uh, conversations accessible. And uh, what we started realizing is a lot of people were sharing stuff that wasn't about finance mm -hmm. on a finance app. So they're Can sharing you give some examples, uh, telling about, um, you know, they'd watch a company come out and then they would explain how they were doing their makeup or uh, <laughs> what concerts they were going to or uh, what was made them excited and we realized the product was a lot bigger than finance, which made me really excited. Yeah. I mean, um, and so... Understandably, yeah. <laughs> hidden use cases. <laughs> so we uh, we really started digging into it. And uh, like any product, you're, um, I always thought it would be really, really powerful if you could, you could change a whole, you can change the world if in one generation we um, shared why people were excited about different things mm -hmm. uh, that... Um, one of the goals we've built in Ibble is um, unlocking things that you don't realize you're curious about. Because I think every other social media platform with proper Facebook groups and Instagram and everything else, you can follow and you can find stuff that you're curious about. But there's stuff that you don't realize you're curious about. You might be swiping through um, other forms of social media and be like, wow, like that's really interesting. I'm excited about locks or wood mm -hmm. woodworking or <clears throat> uh, locks are pretty interesting, especially if you know how to break them. <laughs> I, I, I am obsessed with the lock picking lawyer. Yeah, it's pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and we thought that, you know, if people um, could share those conversations and allow people to jump in, because we've been in this uh, world with social media, I'm an influencer, I'm a celebrity and I'm mm -hmm. speaking down to you. And we didn't want that the occur anymore we want to say let's speak with each other let's let's have conversations with each other and so that's how Ibble was born um mm -hmm. short form social media platform focused on conversations respond how and when you want to respond how video audio text pictures and uh, uh when it's asynchronous so much like a text message you don't have to answer it immediately you pick it up when you want and we allow people to uh fork conversations and spawn them and give references of where the ideas came from. And uh, we've just been exploring those different ideas as time has gone on. It's really exciting. So when you're talking about sort of the future of your company, <clears throat> I think it's use useful in general to think about where is social in general going? Um, one of the things we've seen is there's an app for something. You know, there's sort of the the, the Uber for whatever. Mm -hmm. What There's a social app for something in almost every case. And it feels like there's two completely different things happening. Number one, there's a balkanization happening where you have, for instance, Facebook just announced they may pull some of their apps away from Europe because European law is making it too, you know, onerous on them. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be some balkanization going on where there's an app for Europe or an app for the United States. Yep. <clears throat> there also could be technical apps, like an app for taking photos or a tap app for making videos or some variant or sub variant thereof like where, where do you see things going in the next 5 10 20 years you know we have um we have that compression or consolidation and then expansion and i think we're constantly going through that in, in every industry and we, we've seen it happen um years ago right where we had um aol kind of did everything and then myspace packed on every feature 
and then Facebook expanded and then the explosion, right? Mm-hmm. And Instagram and Twitter and all these other ones kind of um, became those subsets. And I think people are getting sick of um, platforms. And what we really want to focus on is people, not platforms. We don't mm-hmm. care what platform you're on. So um, also, I think a lot of these platforms have lost trust in their users. Not sure. Of course so, they have. So <laughs> we're, and vice uh, versa. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're trying to... Uh, um, we're trying to kind of remove the fat and get back to what social media was supposed to be. And I, I think that it's always been connecting people mm-hmm. and uh, making the world feel a little smaller and closer together. But man, we've gotten away from that the last decade. And uh, I, I think there's a, a simpler way to fix it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Humans are tribalistic. We're supposed to be social and have friend groups and, Social has kind of weirdly made that harder yeah. in a weird way. You brought it up. I mean, like, I thought it was so ridiculous. We had a we had a great conversation with um, a, some pretty influential people from Europe recently, and I was uh, explaining how they could use Ible, and I said, "Listen, there's amazing tech that comes out of Europe, um, but we don't really hear about it much in the United States because a lot of social media platforms have." Um, uh, localize themselves. Mm-hmm. And so uh, unbeknownst to us, you're on Facebook over there and you're going to see a lot of stuff on um, Facebook from Europe. Mm-hmm. And when you're in the United States, you're seeing stuff from US. I mean, think about every time we're all swiping through TikTok and we kind of see all the localization of our area or surrounding area, but we're not seeing what's happening in other countries. And I thought it would be really powerful if we um, we started releasing news features within our product, mm-hmm. allowing people to share their perspective or see other perspectives from geolocation. Imagine what's happening right now, um, not the date this episode, but what's happening with Ukraine and, and Russia. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it'd be really mm-hmm. impactful to see what someone on the ground in Ukraine was saying, mm-hmm. someone in Russia was saying about this, someone in the surrounding countries were saying about this. Because what we're seeing on our news in the United States is uh, everything that we're saying about it. And I, I think that's the wrong way to do it. I, I, if we're going to be a united world, um, if we're going to be friendly with each other, how you start with that is uh, empathizing with each other and seeing mm-hmm. how everybody thinks about things. Mm-hmm. The lingua franca. <laughs> <laughs> if we can all speak the same language in whatever language that is, be it technical means or actually speaking the real language, I think that serves to bring a lot of peace to society Yeah, when it's done well. You know, and that's the crazy part. Like, if that's the core to a, a new social media platform, doesn't seem, um, you know, far fetched or, or difficult. But why aren't we doing it? It's it's a weird question to ask. Mm-hmm. So, about balkanization, there's also the balkanization of things like local laws. Yep. So there can be laws associated with religious issues. For instance, the Prophet Muhammad yep. drawings, or uh, you can have certain disclosure pieces of legislation, exactly the same thing that Facebook is facing right now. Um, but we can have them even within the States, within the United States. So how do you see that evolving? How's that going to change how IBL works in the future? It's, it's a really hard problem to solve, but when we think about building, um, a social media platform, I, we have, you know, thousands and thousands of years of, of, um, human interaction mm-hmm. from different societies that have shown us what works and what doesn't. And the reality is um, we know how to go in a room and have a conversation with each other from different backgrounds and uh, not to be a jerk and insult people. So I think when you're building a technology platform, you should mimic what's already there. All you're trying to do is digitize what we already do in the world. And that's the weird thing that these social media platforms are doing. They're trying to go and put a lens on things and um, and and shift of how human behavior is. The way I think about building a social media platform is um, we have three rules at Ibble. No violence, uh, no uh, hate speech, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, no implicit sexual content on mm-hmm. the on the platform. And if you can go and follow all three of those, you might have someone talking about something in, over here and someone talking about something over here. And if you don't like it, it's as simple as hitting the 
overflow menu and say, don't show that, show me this anymore. Or you just swipe up and the algorithm is smart enough to know and be like, okay, that person doesn't like that type of content. Um, it's like regular life. If you're walking down the street or walking through a park and someone's saying something and it's not, it's not harmful. It's not going to, uh, create violence. It's, it's none of those things, but you just don't like it. You, you, you acknowledge it or you walk right past it and you, you move on to something else. And I think social media uh, platforms should operate the same way. Interact with the content that you want. Find the community that you engage with. But um, I think the big problem a lot of platforms get into is they're trying to be big brother, big sister. They're jumping in there and they're making choices on our behalf and saying, I don't think you should see that. Or I don't like that this is being said. And it's like, come on, we're all like, you know, we're all grown adults. We live in this real world. No, so not all of us. Well, <laughs> but, but why should the digital world be different than the real world? Yeah, I agree. So, so um, I'll, I'll get back to your rules there in the second, because I do think that's interesting to unpack. <clears throat> but one thing I want to say about video in general, it has an interesting effect of attribution. It's really difficult. I mean, even with modern technology to create very good deep fakes. So you pretty much always know it's me if I'm talking, especially if it's coming from my account. Over time, I think what that does in your kind of platform where you can see the person who you're communicating with, you mm -hmm. can see their expression. It's not just the words. You can see the intonation, the tone. I think that adds a lot of color and it can create a pro-social environment. We've had, um, you know, the kind of expand on that. Um, you know, as we're growing, even though we might not be sitting at the Facebook or TikTok levels, we have levels of engagement on our platform that are just incredible. And um, we we do a lot of Q and A's on the platform. You can you, anybody can create a event that they want, or create an ad hoc thread and turn on Q and A and invite and uninvite people as they want. You know, someone asks a great question and be like, "Hey, I know Robert. Robert's a great person to a answer that um, item on security, and I can invite you into the thread." But because we allow the user to respond with video or audio, text and pictures too, but um, what's been amazing is we've heard feedback from our, uh, from our creators and they said, you know, this is the first time I've heard from my fans. Hmm. This is the first time I've seen from my fans. And then on the opposite side, we've gone out and interviewed. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> I think it's amazing because it becomes, it becomes really hard to be a jerk when you, when the person's going to see or hear you. Sure. And then on the other side, it's the same thing. When when someone um, responds to someone, like if a celebrity responds to you, it's similar to what happens today. Like, you know, lo millions of people tweet at Elon all the time, hoping that he writes them. Mm -hmm. But if Elon jumped on a video and responded to a question you asked, it's kind of like, that's a badge of honor. And so we've heard it on the other side. This is the first time I've seen my fans and heard from my fans. And then the other side, the people that are asking the questions are saying, this is the first time I feel seen mm -hmm. by, by someone I look up to or someone I respect. And wow, what a, what a impactful moment that it's happening right now on our platform. Absolutely. It adds a lot of color, I think in general. Um, <clears throat> so I have some very high up Republican and Democrat friends mm -hmm. and the Republicans take on where this is going seems to be the government is probably going to have to run social media or at least some version of social media. Wow. I, I, I know, but, but hear me out just so we can have a conversation yep. about it. Uh, their idea would be that you have to have, you have to be an American citizen or uh, you abide by American law, basically. Yep. So you can be anywhere, but you have to, A, they have to know who you are. Uh, you have to have an account where they can, you know, hang you if you're doing the bad thing or whatever. Uh, but they also would basically say you can all, you can do anything you want. It mm -hmm. just be exactly like a street corner. But that said, exactly like a street corner that is online forever. Yep. Um, with all of the pros and cons associated with that. Now the government running anything sounds kind of bad when it comes to technology. Um, and I know some people at the digital services, so I can say that with a, with a smile on my face. They've been amazing <laughs> at running stuff in the past. Um, maybe I'll even get one of the guys uh, from there over on this podcast, but um, it would be, it would be interesting take to see what a government led social media company could provide in terms of 
a infinite amount of protection for freedom of speech as long as it was within the law. You know, no slander, no liable, yep. no breaking actual, you know, no drug dealers or selling body parts or whatever. Yep. But it also just sounds like a terrible idea, and I can't quite put my finger on why. What do you think? Yeah, I when I think of a government-led social media platform, <laughs> I, I get really worried um, because... We can't even agree in Congress and Senate um, what rules to follow, and even when it falls into rules, what is what is right and what is wrong. And um, I, I just, it, when you say you, you're not sure what the point your finger at of why this feels off, it it just feels like it won't succeed. And if it does succeed, it's going to be highly weighted in one direction. Um, and so, you know, there's plenty of, uh, like the way I kind of think about it is, um, it's a slippery slope with technology companies and it, it doesn't have to be ours. There's, there's plenty of them. There's plenty of platforms out there. There's plenty of people trying to do, um, novel things. I think you want to let innovation happen in the private sector and, um, and make sure rough guardrails are put in place and let the the users decide which route they want to go. That's at least my thought. So let's take one of those guardrails. So yeah. the Kyle Rittenhouse case came up uh, late last year, and I was following it very closely for a number of different reasons. Um, leading into this podcast, actually, was one of those oh, cool. reasons. Um, <clears throat> and so I was doing the normal thing that Robert Hansen does, which is a ton of research, which means searching for all the horrible things you could possibly yep. imagine. Um, and that that's for anyone who actually does research for a living. They know you're, you should never look at my search history. It's uh, yeah. it's pretty abysmal, <laughs> but um, it was interesting to watch Kyle Rittenhouse's case in particular on Facebook, because one day I could search for Kyle Rittenhouse and there's content. The very next day, suddenly the search results were barren. It said there was whatever, 60,000 yeah. messages the, that day or whatever, but it wouldn't show me any of them. And then you might think, okay, that's just a conspiracy. They're, they just messed mm -hmm. up. You know, people make mistakes or whatever. But then later they removed the part that showed me how many results there were. So it's not like they just did the one thing. They actually went through and made additional code changes to further make it more difficult to see what was going on. Yeah. Then the day that Kyle Rittenhouse was exonerated um, by a jury of his peers, suddenly it was available content. Yep. So I don't know what got in their head that that was something that made sense to them, but I, I suspect it was this violence rule. I suspect that they don't want to glorify violence, and that's why they didn't want this to happen. But from my perspective, I wasn't particularly interested in the violence. I was more interested in the case law. Yep. So how... How do you put in guardrails that both protects people who do, do not want to see someone getting murdered, you know, especially over and over again, because it was yep. very, very widely publicized, but also allow people like myself or other researchers to do what they need to do to actively understand what's search. going on. Yeah, actively search for things and, and not be put into a, into a black hole. I wish I could get in their heads, right? Like, where do you, where did a platform with, with clean idea ideas and simple functionality become censored right was it that you not have to start um establishing new roles with the company that that's their job to protect the audience i don't know i my stance at ibble maybe it changes right and it, it, we should go back in a few years and see um you know somehow did we get tainted along the way i, mm -hmm. I mean but I hope we don't. I the way I think about things is that's part of what this conversation is. By the way, Raymond, yeah. I want to make sure that if you're going to do it, you do it because this is what your plan is. I don't yeah. want you to. I don't want you to fall into disarray. Yeah, my my goal of building Ible has always been um, make conversations accessible, um, hard ones, easy ones. I think if you're going to have if you're going to have content, have both sides of the coin and don't censor one versus the other because um, then then we're not growing. We're not expanding our minds. It, it becomes truly an echo chamber. And I feel like a lot of social media platforms have become like this. Uh, 
I know I'd be really upset on our platform if if someone requested that feature and and said let's let's snipe the content. When we when we talk about our three rules of uh, you know no violence on the platform, yeah, well, expound on that. What what would that look like? What gets kicked off? I I have a very uh, zero tolerance for bullying on the platform, and so I I don't want to see a platform where people that are trying to find their people. Um, what we started realizing, and you and you've seen this happen with Facebook groups, is where Ibble can really grow and be different than a lot of places. Is um, Instagram and Facebook and all these platforms they start it with, and it, they're still to the, this day in a lot of regards. Um, you find the people that you know, and you watch their content, and yeah, you can slowly find stuff along the way. Well, Facebook groups started morphing a little bit, right? Because mm -hmm. you could find people you didn't know that were interested in things that you were, and so it's kind of the Reddit world, yep. you know. D dig into that. We we've been exploring that idea that we think um, we could revolutionize social media by really making people readily accessible to jump in and have conversations about stuff that they didn't even realize they were passionate about and that they didn't realize they were curious about and they could learn something along the way. And so, but if someone's coming on there and trying to troll or bullying, um, get off our platform, right? Like that's not what we're here for. You can do that somewhere else. Go go have a good time. <clears throat> so to press, press that button a little bit. Yep. So let's say someone is wrong. They're just wrong. Sky is orange. Be wrong. You know, the sky is whatever, some random yep. color that it's the not. The earth is flat. There you go. There yep. you go. So how much of people correcting that person does it take for you to say that that's bullying or for you to say, we're going to get out of the way and let this person be re-educated? That's the whole idea of communities, right? <clears throat> like if, if you believe that stuff and you you really want to discuss it and you're super passionate about it. What, who should I be to go and get involved in saying no, stop, right? And moderate that. I think that's the, the messed up thing of a lot of lab platforms. Listen, if you really uh, like, don't believe you should drink water and every, and every drink you should have is soda and you want to find a community circled around that, go and find that community Hang out, discuss, have a good time. Sponsored by Mountain Dew. There we go, <laughs> Dr Pepper. <laughs> but but um, I don't think we should be part of that censoring. I don't think we should be part of that reeducation. And I'm obviously giving silly examples here, but we're starting no, to see it's useful. We're starting to see that more and more where they're forcing people to put disclaimers on things. And um, and in your, your example, they're hiding the content mm -hmm. and and. Uh, I just don't think it's right. It's like it, you, it should be smart enough. The algo should be smart enough to know that you don't want to interact with that content. And so just don't show it to you. And so those are, you know, I think it's not, we're, we're creating solutions to problems that shouldn't exist. I think when I, and I, when I say we like social media platforms and um, I think it's way easier than what we make it out to be. And yeah, it exposes and maybe it might make some people upset along the way, but that's real life, right? You you walk down the street and you might interact with a few crazy people on down 6th Street, Austin here. And mm -hmm. there's a few. But, <laughs> but why, but why, you know, like don't let it bother you. You so have one, to be grown up. One thing I would say that is good about Reddit um, and you, to your point, Facebook groups is that sort of self moderation. Yep. That group did, gets to decide what the rules of its own miniature group are. Yep. Now you may not like that, but you can always just create your own group if that's that's you really want a different. This this world is. Uh, if you want to isolate yourself into a corner, go ahead. Yeah. Like we we have the ability to go and on nibble like, just create a hashtag. So we could create today. Uh, you can go and post and say Robert is awesome hashtag. And so all the content gets collected under that hashtag. And so in the simplest form, that's a group. And so you can start finding people to have conversation with. Um, so as you start having discussions or conversations or whatever else like that, you can leave them open-ended for anybody to join if you want to. And you can close them. Like we we thought of, again, making, making the world simpler. We just start with a stage. Who do you want to be on the stage with you? 
who should be in the audience? Is it wide open in the audience? Is it a closed loop in the audience? Do you want to invite anybody to join you on the stage? And, or is the stage wide open? When you start with just those base rules, is this is how we do conferences, is how we do school, right? Um, and so some p- teachers might choose to allow any student to get up and discuss anything they want. Some teachers may say, my rules of this classroom is I'm talking and you're listening. Mm-hmm. And you get this, we're bound in in the world, we're bound by these basic rules of how we interact with in uh, elementary school and high school and college and vocational school and work. And so why should a platform be different? So, so a friend of mine <clears throat> used to work at uh, Twitter mm-hmm. at the time he brought me in to, to try to handle their bot problem. They have a enormous bot, pro- bot problem. So, uh, <laughs> he did not believe it was solvable, but he was willing to hear me out. And I said, okay, here's what I would do. And he immediately, immediately said, okay, that's a great idea. We should probably start doing all these things. And part of it was starting to instrument bots in particular that they know are bots. Like there's, you can start with the easy ones. Um, and the easiest way to do that is just buy a bunch of bots and point them at yourself. Um, and that's a collection of things you can monitor. So during that process, he basically started, I mean, probably shouldn't have done this, but he was trolling other people in his department with these bots, uh, trying to explain to them that these things do exist, despite how much they said that they don't exist. Yep. And as a result, they eventually fired him hmm. instead of actually handling the bot problem. And to my knowledge, they have still not handled that bot problem. Is he looking for work? <laughs> <laughs> He's, he has since moved on to greener pastures. But um, I think this is an interesting problem. When you say they have they have some uh, some quote, they said, you know, be careful of the person on the other end of the keyboard. But what if there is no person on the other end of the hmm. keyboard? Like, what if we're talking about just enormous onslaught of garbage that looks like a lot of people are upset, but really it's just the same person over and over again? Yeah. I mean, how do you handle, obviously that is some type of harassment, but it looks an awful lot like social pressure. Yeah. How do you, how do you start tackling that problem? You know, we're starting to see, um, you, you have the nefarious side of it, right? Like how do we steer audiences? Um, we all probably aren't aware, but we're seeing the opposite side of it. How do we make each other happy? Um, I, I urge any of you to look at the numbers on TikTok and and wonder if you actually believe them. Mm-hmm. So go look at comment rates versus likes versus everything else. Those they're spoofing those numbers left and right to give you dopamine hits. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know when I when I go back and I think of you know if you if you had a bot pointed at you and you have one person trying to steer the public i think that's what's happened with a lot of what a lot of social media platforms they've oh, for sure it is happening yeah, yeah. And, and but not just but just not like to make someone upset but like imagine steering persona of how how people think or how they want to vote a certain way mm-hmm. um i think how you a lot of these platforms are based on the typing and and ibble emphasis has not been necessarily on the typing it's been on the the person's voice you you hit mm-hmm. on it their intonation in their voice how they how they look how they're uh, the passion that they're speaking of if they're on video and so the emphasis on the comments is is less important on our platform but it's obviously like the basis of twitter and it's the basis of reddit and, mm-hmm. and a lot of other platforms so i think naturally by um you could obviously go build systems with deep fakes and have a it's whole hard. bunch of personas to it, go it, out there difficult. and do. I mean, but <clears throat> but it's a lot easier if it's just text. Hey, but it, but we 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 think of. I don't know how long ago that bot issue was, but. Um, well, let's just say it hasn't been solved yet. <laughs> yeah, but if we go and move forward, we might be having this question in ten years. I mean, I I think I've I've seen online where people have you know uh, taken these deep fake programs and and uh, tried to create the. Uh, you know, like there's now actors and actresses that are fully simulated right in the world. So they don't have to worry about paying residuals and everything else Mm -hmm. out, uh, out there. So if we zoom this conversation forward a decade, wow, that might be a new way of manipulating the audience. You spin up, uh, a hundred thousand variants of Robert's 
face morphed with Raymond's mm-hmm. and they're all talking about the negativity of stuff. It's it's a hard problem to solve. Um, this is back to the government thing where they actually know who you are. <clears throat> I realize, I understand yeah. that that's a very sketchy dystopian future where the government controls communication but it's not a world i want to be in me me neither and also i i just see it coming at the same time yeah um so well well, i I will say like what we're talking about here even though it would take a lot of uh computational power and everything to go and do that what's the next iteration going to be i mean you're posing a, a amazing thought experiment because you know text is something i mean a lot of the viewers listening to this, there's probably a lot of uh, computer science folks and it, it wouldn't be hard to build a bot, right? No. And you probably probably find 90% of the code uh, online to get you started. Mm-hmm. With where Facebook is going with meta of the virtualization of your face, not that far off. And we're seeing how good, um, you know, uh, protocols that are out there that are doing uh, text to voice uh, manipulation and everything else. Mm-hmm. I see that being, you know, a few week project to go and manipulate a thousand or 10,000 uh, people walking th- with your avatar on meta. At least our stuff being like in video and audio feels like maybe it's a decade away yeah, or we five get, years away. We got away. time. We yeah. have time. But not, maybe not much, but we have time. Yeah. Oh, Scary, well, man. Yeah, I know. It's Where's very... my bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So... I wanted to talk a little bit about the actual process of taking stuff down. So harassment of whatever kind, let's just say we've we've defined it, which I am not saying we have actually, but let's say you can say this thing is definitely harassment. Yep. What is the process that you go through? Is there a human? Is there a committee? Is there a robot that just does does a first pass? Like how, how do you handle incoming concerns about uh, whatever the content would be so without uh, i'll i'll skate over the first one because we have some cool ip that sits against this but what we do is um we we image process every video that's up so if someone pulls out a knife a gun stuff like that Mm -hmm. it detects it um but we don't know are they just showing off their gun Mm -hmm. are they showing off their new knife Mm -hmm. is it airsoft yeah (laughs) right (laughs) so that stuff gets flagged and so, um, and at that point we have to do human interaction because we're trying to train, train everything to say, sure. is this right? Is this wrong? And, uh, so that's, that's first level. Second level is, uh, and we have this on the platform right now, like you can go in and dot, hit the overflow menu and say, report this content. And, uh, we've had some hot button issues on our platform that got reported thousands of times. And the question is. Well, that that basically rings the siren for us. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, we should take a look at this. Mm-hmm. And so um, if it's something that we're really worried about, like a gun coming onto the platform, we might even choose to, uh, the content's still up, but what we've done is we've stopped serving it up to the masses, but your friends are going to see it, right? Mm-hmm. So like if uh, I have a thousand friends that are following me and they like my content, they're going to see it. But the people that don't know you, uh, it might disappear for a small amount of time until human interaction gets to look at it and say, is this right? Is this wrong? And uh, With time signatures, they're not watching a a long video. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so um, we've also done some pretty cool stuff with other IP um, that we've been testing. And so, you know, what we can do is instead of taking out the whole clip, we can blur Mm -hmm. that exact second. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, there's a reason why our platform right now is 18 and up. It's really to, we're trying to be thought leaders of, of a lot of stuff that will happen. Um, letting younger folks below 18 onto the platform, COPA laws. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we think of, you know, in the next few months, as we release all these new features out, we could be the thought leaders of how to protect youth on the internet and, um, ensure that, you know, there's, there's stuff, maybe their parents are like, Hey, I don't, you know, want them to see that. And it becomes really easy for us because for them to have an iPhone or Android, their, their parents are signing up with their account and, and attesting how old they are. And so, so back to the content itself for a second, 
18 and under is a great example. So yep. Reddit handles this by buttons you have to click. Yep. Which is not exactly a, yeah. a, a large Web hurdle. Web apps, man. They're hard, right? <laughs> but let's say you manage to get that part right. Um, what is the difference? How are you defining something that's 18 and up like pornography, for, for instance, which is a big, hairy mess, no pun yeah. intended. Um, and... I would be interested to see how you'd handle something like the statue of David or someone's baby photo or something that is clearly a human being naked, but it is not necessarily something that you would immediately point to and say that is pornography. Yeah. You know what? That's why we have to start with the less rules than anything else, because and even though there there's some rules in place, but we're not. You look at Twitter's rule base or or other people's or Facebook's. Holy crap! Like, mm-hmm. good luck trying to decipher what they want out of it. And Apple's just goes and leaves. Uh, f- for example, for the audience, um, one rule that they have is no promotion of violence. And yet, promotion literally means yeah. trying to get someone's content out there. So, are they banning Marvel movies because uh, those promote violence and yeah. they're uh, they clearly advertise on their platform. So there's a definitely a double standard even in their own rules. When we've had our team internally moderate, what our goal is, um, especially at this point that we're 18 and up, so we, we get to really test the boundaries here, is try not to take down content. You know, like if somebody's on the platform and they're doing something really egregious, we will we will hide that content. We will take that content down. Uh but you know, I, I can count on, on, uh, you know, two hands when we've done that so mm-hmm. far and we're not about doing that. But again, I think, and those were egregious cases, presumably a lot of, uh, you know, hate speech, mm-hmm. uh, was some of it and, uh, you know, straight up sexual content on the, on the main feed. Mm-hmm. And outside of that, we, we try not to block the content because, someone's going to want to see that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the way I think about it is, you know, if, if it's something that you just don't like being said, and I think that's where 90% of this stuff is, um, then swipe to the next video and the algo should be enough to figure it out. Or you really want to go a step further and long hold or go to the overflow menu and say like block this user Mm -hmm. or just don't show me content like this anymore. And you will not see it anymore. I mean, you know, what is that saying that a lot of people say? Um, like it's the less than 1% of people on the internet doing, you know, 90% of the damage. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, it, by users reporting other users and us going in and looking and be like, wow, this person really is kind of like a bad seed of, for what we're trying to do on the platform. It becomes easier to, to, you know, push them off the platform if it comes to it. But again, I want when we when we think about the rate of why and how Facebook or Twitter or other platforms are banning people or even TikTok right now for what we're talking about. I'm talking about someone getting be, be, beheaded. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm talking about someone, you know, masturbating mm-hmm. uh, open into the platform. Those are the things we're talking about. Someone threatening to kill someone. Uh, not saying I don't like your idea. So that one, that last one's obvious because it's a, uh, or the first one and the last one are obvious because those are breaking the law. <clears throat> I think, I think there's no, there's, I don't think anyone's going to complain about that one. Yep. Uh, the masturbating one, you might get in trouble with um, whether that passes the Miller test because does it? I mean, is that newsworthy? What if it was? We have we have private rooms, and so if you really want to, <laughs> for really want to go down. But, but what if it's somebody uh, noteworthy? What if it's uh, the president of the United States doing it? Would that would that be something that is passes the Miller test because it is something that's would invoke the media to go that is noteworthy. Um, again, know, good, right? th- <laughs> good good thought experiment. We haven't. Uh, we haven't run into these edge cases yet. And and I think what you're exposing is... Um, no pun intended. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> you have to be willing to take a stance and say, this is the line, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe some of these platforms just kept on pushing that line and going further and further. That's definitely and, what happened. And I, and I think that what we're doing with here with Ibble is we're trying to hold that line as much as possible. We've had um, 
you know, people have been on the platform and upset why we haven't taken content down. We've had employees uh, upset that we haven't taken content down. And so uh, we've been trying to hold that line as, as long as possible. And I think the great thing is we're well, we're supported by a great group of advisors and VCs and everything else. And they're willing to support us in that path of holding that line. So let's talk a little bit about the safe harbor laws. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the things that Facebook and Twitter use very heavily. They say, well, we're we're kind of like a carrier. We're kind of like the telephone system. Yep. And you can't take eight you can't hold AT&T accountable just because two people are talking over the phone yep. and saying something bad. So it, it's supposed to pass that that standard. But also they get sort of the benefit of saying, well, you can't sue us because we're allowed to do we're allowed to, we're just a transport. We're just a carrier. Yep. At the same time, they are publishers. Very clearly, they mm -hmm. are publishers. Um, they publish everybody's content for them. And they host them, and then they take content down when they decide that it, that doesn't meet their standards. Yep. So in in many ways, they're no different than a news station or something. Yeah, where with a whole bunch of different reporters mm -hmm. bringing ideas and concepts and everything forward. Exactly. So they're... There's a bit of concern, I think, amongst the more conservative uh, side that their side is not being seen. But what that ends up looking like is, well, maybe we need to have legislation to push back on that and make them so that they are now one of two things. Either they're not a carrier, which is interesting, or they are a publisher, one of the two. You can't have it both ways. Yeah. Um, and then subsequently, there's been a couple pieces of legislation. The most recent one uh, was HB 20 in Texas. Man, this is a very fascinating uh, piece of legislation. So apparently it started life as uh, some bail reform law, uh, and <laughs> somehow it ended up being a piece of anti-censorship legislation that was aimed specifically at companies uh, that are over 50 million active users uh, that are social media platforms specifically. Yep. And there's a huge amount of accountability built into the law that basically says that they have to report how they take people down and in what way and what, what law do they break? And if they didn't break a law, what, who yeah. reported it and what did you do about it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, effectively just making it extremely onerous to take down content that isn't meant to be taken down. And if it doesn't, if there isn't a legal reason, a real base, basis to do it, um, either based on their terms of service. So they still have the ability to say, we don't allow this content, but it has to be clearly defined. Yep. Um, or they're just not allowed to do a period. Now, Facebook and Twitter, um, uh, they fought back uh, through an advocacy, um, advocacy, advocacy, advocacy group. <clears throat> that group basically said that this is censorship of a different kind. You're basically saying that the government is now stepping in and forcing publishers to do something. So currently it is locked down. There, this is not currently a thing. But uh, if you're a Texas-based resident and this does come live, if, uh, suddenly it gives you a conduit to sue social media companies if they don't comply by leaving your content up, unless yep. it breaks some terms of service that's clearly defined. Yep. So, what do you think about that? <laughs> I know it's a I know it's a big one, but what what do you think? <sighs> There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Uh, everybody's trying to sue everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> um. We, we get into this world all the time. Our, our legal has us look at this because, you know, as we, we have a podcast studio and we help people out get, get difficult conversations out. Are we, are we a publisher? Are we a platform? Are we, a um, you know, and, and what are the laws? What are you? I think we're still figuring that out. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the reason why this podcast caught, podcast studio started was the idea that um, I think there was a lot of influential people that could have great conversations like we're having right now sure. and create that as a basis to, uh, we have a feature on Nibble called Spark, the ability to spin off a conversation, fork a conversation and kind of reference where the idea came from. So we thought, well, if we're going to uh, have that platform, a lot of social media is all about dancing and what you look like and the vanity side. And so there's not a, actually a ton of really highly impactful conversations that are on video. I mean, there's stuff on Reddit and there's a very surface level stuff on Twitter. So we thought, hey, let's have amazing conversations on barbecue and law and 
uh, art and uh, men's health and everything else and, mm. and give these sparkable moments to allow people to go down. I think we're still trying to figure out how, how we blend here. The, the one way we've always approached it is we don't run our own podcast. It doesn't um, have it there. So I think we lend more to being a platform than a publisher because... Um, and I am not paying you. Yeah. Yeah. And it, because we say whoever wants, whoever we think is a really impactful conversation, whatever it is, if they give us the case and we think it's uh, the world needs it and it would, it fits our user base wherever it is go ahead, use the studio, have a fun time. We're even expanding this stuff to give um, uh, people a way to get important, important conversations out. We don't make a cent from it and we provide the services and um, we think of it as goodwill to the community. So in that regard, we're not pushing content. So I feel like we're a platform, but I'm sure someone will argue it and say, you know, like, no, you you know, like you're steering stuff in a weird way or they'll, they'll make some excuses of, um, you know, what gets promoted through the trending algorithm. So are we a, are we a publisher and stuff like that? These are the parts of, of building a business that I don't, <laughs> I don't get excited about. I, 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 I try to focus on the product. I try to f focus on the goodwill that, that happens in the world. But, mm -hmm. and th this again, circles back to the whole issue with the government. I think, as soon as we get into this world that everybody's suing each other and getting upset with each other, um, it okay. takes away innovation and, uh, it, it, it sucks up, it sucks up the important stuff that should be happening out in the world. So speaking of existential threats, <laughs> yeah. gosh, uh, make me drink tonight. <laughs> One of the things that I think is dangerous for you um, is you are not an ecosystem that just can sit there by itself. You are definitely supported by Apple and Google and and whomever you host your platform with, yep. uh, Google Cloud, let's say, um, or Azure or AWS or whatever, yep. right? These, these are all the same problem over and over again. And none of these companies have a particularly great track record of just allowing content to live. Yep. Uh, they all uh, have taken content down. Uh, also, companies like Cloudflare and so on. It's it's kind of a you're in a weird position because you can do everything right uh, from a First Amendment perspective, allowing content to live, mm -hmm. uh, to engage in good conversation, whatever, and still be taken down by virtue of some other company deciding that they don't like your content. It yep. doesn't meet their terms of service. Yep. So how do, have you sort of navigated that already or have you thought through that? You know, we, we, when we started, um, when we started building the platform, we've had a lot of, um, highly influential people reach out to us and to us, it was always a scaling problem. It was, Hey, um, and I want this to be really clear, come across clearly. We don't care um, as long as as long as there's no hate speech and violence and that's an implicit sexual nature on the platform. We don't care who's on the platform, but sometimes it's it's a scaling problem, right? You don't want your platform to be seen as single sided. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I wouldn't have anything to do with you if you yeah, were either yeah, side, by the yeah. way. So we've, we've done a, I think we've done a fantastic job of, um, trying to extend the olive branch for everybody to see this as a place to have awesome conversations on tarot card readings and makeup and, um, uh, military, uh, veterans and just a little bit of everything, right. That's on here. And, um, that's something that we've, we've really stood by up until this point, but, um, and I'm trying not to scoot around the, the question you're asking. No. I, I yeah. think, I think we're going to get to that point where as the platform grows, we're going to bring just every kind of personality on board and hopefully it's not seen as steered in one way or the other and, and it becomes really showing all sides of the conversation and, and let people choose what they want to hear. And I think that's, 
it's one of the hardest things to do, I guess, on building a, a social media platform because everybody wants to steer. Like, it's so crazy who comes out of the woodworks. As soon as you start getting traction, someone wants to pick it up versus a side. I try not to lo- live in fear of what Cloudflare, or Amazon, or all these other platforms are going to get into. I think if we would have went in on day one, we've seen it happen with t- Parler or something else. If we would have steered left or right or uh, taken a stance on something versus another, um, someone's going to get upset and someone's going to advocate to break the platform down and strip it down to nothing. And I just, I, I choose not to live in fear of what someone else is going to do to the platform. I just try to do, you know, follow what we've always heard, like do what your mama has, has taught us, right? <laughs> be nice to people. They'll be nice back to you and, and, uh, try to be a good host. And, um, and that's how I think the platform should be is we're, we're being a good host to every single personality, every single background. And, um, uh, you know, I think if we do that, we, we have nothing to fear from the platforms, but if they want to take it down, you know, so be it. Like I, 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 I held by my virtues and I built something special, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bend one way or the other because someone's gonna say, um, if you don't, you're gone. I think the next version of HP 20 probably will have to take this into account. It will have to go after the content providers as well as the ISPs of the world or the, the people who control where things can be hosted. Cause if not, none of these things have any teeth whatsoever. They can just say, Nope, well, we're not going to allow Facebook anymore because we just don't like Facebook and their content. Well, this is like, think about what's going to happen. <clears throat> like we we've talked about this in the beginning of the conversation where I think, that highly impactful conversations should happen around the world and in and, and opening us up to um, perspective and diversity and understanding of where each person is coming from. There's going to be pissed off people <laughs> along the way, right? <laughs> and, but, you know, you ha- we have to tell that story where it's political, it, it's public outcry if they censor that. Because if this becomes like that Ibel is the only one fighting this this fight and we're the only ones standing up for, um, you know, neutrality across the board um, and, and diversity across the board, then we're going to be like everything else. It's going to be um, U.S. people are going to be talking to U.S. people mm-hmm. and... Catholics are going to be talking to Catholics and Muslims are going to be talking to Muslims and so on and so on. That's a great segue. So censorship and filter bubbles, I think are, there's a theory in economics that basically says that um, people will say, I want to vote for XYZ candidate. But when they actually get to the voting poll booth and they actually start deciding which one they're going to pick, the revealed preference can often be completely different than the, what they've said. And that, that kind of flies in the face of traditional economic theory. They're, they're supposed, they said they wanted this thing. They've been saying this whole time. Why would they change it at the very last second? Mm-hmm. I think social media has sort of a separate, its own kind of revealed preference. It sort of reveals itself as wanting censorship. It reveals itself as wanting filter bubbles. Uh, and for those who don't know what filter bubbles are, um, if I type in Egypt and I'm in Egypt, I might find local news. If I type Egypt and I'm in the United States, I might find uh, something about travel to Egypt or something. So yep. very, very different content. But worse yet, people might only be, um, they may only be able to see the content that is most suited to them, despite the fact that it might be the content that is least good for them. Yep. Um, so Facebook ran a mood manipulation study, um, I think it was maybe 2016 or something. And uh, I actually got in touch with a researcher and I actually got the code. So I was able to see what it looked like. And it's very stupid, very easy to write code. And I think the amount of uh, symbols that they used to detect what thing that they wanted to make it uh, pro or con, make you feel good or bad, was only maybe 50 or 100 terms total. It was very, very wow. short. Um but even in that short study, they were able to um, manipulate the moods of, I think, 40,000 people or something. That is pretty terrifying, A, that they would run that kind of experiment, but B, 
The it, CIA was so excited. <laughs> They're like, yes. And it was so simple. I mean, all they really did was decide that these people are only going to get to see bad things that put them in a bad mood, theoretically. They don't know for a fact that, that was going to work or not, or only get to see good things. And sure enough, it actually did change people's mood. Mm. So that's the problem with filter bubbles. Um, you get to decide what content they see and get to decide as a content provider what mood they're going to be in. Yeah. Like, how do you combat that? How do you make sure that that is not where you end up? You're balancing out. So like a lot of these platforms are, are sometimes you go too far, right? Um, you get away from what you're trying to do on the platform. So for example, like we're, we're 27 minutes of daily active engagement on the platform per day which is incredible for for uh, any any platform and we're growing, right? Well, if I zoom forward in a year from now and really highly impactful conversations are there, but we have some product manager sitting there and be like, okay, we're sitting at like 45 minutes, like TikTok right now. I think they're like 55 minutes per day. We need to pull another 10 minutes out of it. Like, are we doing harm to people? Mm -hmm. Like at what point are you, is it, is this now like a revenue thing that you're trying to squeeze energy out of people? And I've never, I've never thought about our product that way. I haven't urged anybody to go in that but how direction. How about your board? I mean, huh? how about your board, your, your shareholders? You know, what I thought was really impactful is our, our VCs, they were the seed investors behind uh, Instagram and um, WhatsApp and LinkedIn. Uh, when they were at Sequoia, they're at, they're the amazing VC fund in um, uh, Columbus now, Columbus, Ohio. And so what uh, what I thought was amazing is they saw how a lot of social media platforms have lost their way. I I, I don't want to speak for them right now, but I think they would I think they would support us in the journey of you know what brings value. What are we trying to What are we trying to do with this platform and um, I think there's, there's, is there a conscious there? Are they, are they feeling, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give quotes of what they've said, but, they, but they, but they definitely have realized that in the past, maybe they went astray on a few things and yeah, it became a lot of value, but you know, at some point you, you think of the mental health of the world I mean, look how destructive social media has become. People are focused so much on vanity and depressions spawning from that and suicide and all these other things i don't know I, I don't know if i'm answering your question but i think so um i think there's there's but how do you prevent the filter bubble how do you how do you deliver you know you want you and... want to do localization like if i'm okay so now this is the engineer turning on for me that's great if if you want localization because if i search food you probably want to see stuff that you can get out into the world and engage with right mm -hmm. so if i search pizza I probably want to see something like I want to see Austin stuff, blend it with around the United States, blend it with other areas. And so that's a perfect example of, I think, bringing value. Now let's talk about the way to, to hide things, right? Like when you're talking about with the Kyle Rittenhouse example, like you search something and it, it shows only one side of the lens or it, it, it hides it and and sways you away from it. I don't know. I, I still think if you're, if you're actively searching for something, mm -hmm. show them the content. And if you're passively searching stuff, we should know enough about what you're interested in to show you that content. So, you know, if you're searching, if you're searching in your example, you're searching Egypt, like what brings you value? And, um, you know, if, if a story is trending in Egypt right now, I think it's the right responsibility of the platform to show what's trending, right? And not be like, oh, no, no we don't want to show a hot bucket, a hot ticket item that's happening in London or Egypt or wherever around the world. We only want to show the happy-go-lucky um, aspect to it. So I guess that's as you're building the product, um, you, you shouldn't overcomplicate it. And I think that's where a lot of these platforms get into because they don't want to, like, if, why am I searching Egypt, right? Well, maybe there was something weird that just happened. Maybe there was, maybe there's a political turmoil that's happening over there. 
why aren't we showing that story? Maybe there's a new election that's happening over there and people are interested in it. But why aren't we showing that story? Why aren't we showing people having conversations about it? Specifically, why aren't we showing people from those countries? Like if you're searching those uh, different items, why aren't showing people discuss those items from over there? I think that gets just into like, how do you display the content? How do you let them uh, circle around it? How do you let them filter through it? That is certainly going to be a challenge in the future, I think, for you. It's a UI <clears throat> problem, actually. Of course. Of yeah, course. because you want to surface the the important stuff, but you don't want to lose lose aspect to the other stuff. I think just a lot of these platforms get so far so far focused of like tuning the algo into like be happy, spend more time here, so we can throw more ads your way, and you know that's not necessarily how we think about doing things. Yeah. So that leads me to my next question: <clears throat> How do you see Content that is extremely shareable, yep. but is also clearly just clickbait oh, and man. clearly designed to inflame people. And obviously it is good for ad revenue, yep. inc incredibly good, but it is clearly just, you know, this is the saccharine of content. This is the worst thing for you. Yep. Yeah, we, um, you know, we, we're approaching things slightly different on, um, you know, everybody went in the direction of ads back in the day, and we didn't steer into that. We want to be a, a creator-focused uh, ecosystem. And so things that we're moving towards is um, tips and subscriptions and paid events and clubs. Um, we think of a way that... Think about how many creators that you watch probably on a daily basis that, you know, you wake up in the morning and you see their content and you maybe smile or you feel better about yourself and you learn something. And I think it's a weird world that we're, we're not helping support their growth and their life. Or if they're doing that and making thousands of people happy, right, on a daily basis, or maybe they're sharing mental health things that make someone not commit suicide that evening, why aren't we uh, making it easy for them to make a career and a life from from creating content and so a lot of the features we're trying to go and do is um you know the, there'll obviously always be like free aspects of ibble and um but you know maybe if you're um if you're a personal trainer you, you're sharing the free content but if you want to get into the nitty-gritty of what the meal plans are for the day that's that's behind a, a paywall with subscriptions and if you want to go and sit in a seminar um you know talking about um you know how to you know, learn a new skill. Maybe that's a paid event, and we think of that uh, creator economy that we're we're trying to support. But but as of right now, ads are not even on our um, uh, roadmap. So, <clears throat> a, a adage amongst my friends, anyway, goes something like this: Once upon a time, the smartest people in the world worked in government. Mm -hmm. Then they all moved to the stock market, <laughs> and now they're all in ad revenue. Yep. They're all just the smartest people in the world are just there putting tiny little boxes of ads next to yeah. search results. Um, so if you're not going to do the ad model, how do you how do you monetize your user base? Or are you just going to say, this is now on the content provider? Um, and since you're not the content provider, you're just a platform from what yeah. I heard. <laughs> uh, how do you enable them to make as much revenue as they possibly can, so therefore you can sharehold, uh, so you can share some of that upside. And the reason that's important is if you're not successful in this business, if you can't make a go of it, based on them making a go of it, this won't work. This is kind of an interesting experiment where you're sort of more the Substack model, where you uh, you have a whole bunch of people out there making content, and hopefully it works. Otherwise, this thing is just a very big expense. Yeah, um, I think what we're seeing. We're seeing this direction. We, we've put a lot of ideas and thoughts into this, and um, you know our pitch deck was floating around out there. And now we're seeing Twitter and Facebook and all these people trying, all these other platforms trying to release features that kind of mirror the direction we want to go into. We've always believed that support your creators and and take a small cut of it, and uh, you become uh, you become the intermediary because. What do we see during um, the pandemic, right? OnlyFans became 
multi-billion dollars a year until they revenue. shut down the porn i know <laughs> and it, we're no longer a porn site wait all of our revenue went away we are a porn site we are back we're back baby <laughs> that's so ridiculous so um you, you know we we think there's a world that i can tell you we, we have an influencer relation team here and we we work with hundreds of influencers even right now and what's really um impactful is until you get to a certain size twitter uh tiktok all those facebook they don't even want to deal with you right and when you're in the world of a thousand followers uh or hundred thousand followers fifty thousand followers um you're still driving traffic you're still creating content you should still be able to make a revenue off this content mm -hmm. and so i think if you can create um uh, the automated tools that do it and, um, and, and support you in that route. And we take a small cut along the way. It's kind of like the direction that YouTube tried to be, but then because YouTube is sitting on, um, the ad model that's mm -hmm. on the other side of it and then demonetize the channels and they're like, Hey, figure it out yourself. And then you gotta, you gotta go out there and find your own sponsors and hire a sponsorship team and everything else. We kind of strip that all back and make it really easy for, creators to um uh create fun content or engaging content or just engage with their fans and 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 make money uh those routes so is there an ethical or more ethical way to promote content that has a better sort of outcome for society so this this is the good this is the upside of the filter bubble so you know that there's something that if everyone watched this they, their day would be a little bit better yep how do you curate that content in a way that is both useful but also not destroying someone who's trying to do their research and find the the not so nice parts of the internet so that they can do their job you know it's the hardest thing is like do you 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 can see through the data of what's a highly engaged piece of content and but i think it's the platform that dictates what that content is because you know again we'll get 55 minutes of daily active engagement on on um TikTok. on tiktok but, you know, for the while, for the longest time was, you know, it, before they started adding learn on TikTok and all these other things, the direction that we went down a long time ago before they went, um, you know, it was just a dancing platform. It's in their name, TikTok, Metrodome. It's, you know, focused on dancing and music and everything else. And so what, so was that content, was that 55 minutes of time that you were sitting on the app, even in early days as Musical.ly? Was that like highly engaging and teaching you anything, or was that just like brain drumming? Is that is that the equivalent of what MTV did years ago or History Channel did years ago and finding something that we will be glued to our TV and <laughs> wide open and just consuming stuff? Are we actually learning, or at some point are we? Has it gone past that and it's in one ear out the other and it's 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 dampening our life? You know, time will tell. I I think we we try to we're not centered in of, of i think 27 minutes of daily active engagement for us right now is great no, that's right and we we're not trying to optimize every t second or anything else what we're trying to focus on is the amount of conversations that spawn from the platform i feel like that's a a better a better direction that brings more value to the platform so back to your point is that us you know like is that us playing around with the filter bubble to make people feel happier because they're participating in conversations? I guess you could take it that way, right? Because we're we're trying different things to make people feel um, involved in, in an inclusive environment where they feel like they can spin off a conversation, invite their friends, and discuss things, or find new friends on a platform. You know, it's a it's a I guess a very thin line of of how you're you know, how you're um, optimizing your, your time. Or... And, and to that point, <clears throat> I think one of the things a lot of these companies run afoul of is they, they pick their favorites, but the problem is their favorites aren't very good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they tend to be journalists as their favorites. Yeah. And I, I don't actually have a ton against journalists themselves, but they're just, there aren't, they're just, they don't really exist anymore. Like once upon a time, yes, journalism was a real thing and you could find them and, uh, they were hard hitting and they really wanted to do a good job. But now it's all clickbaity, huh? Yeah. And now it's all driven on ads. And it has a lot to do with the fact that 
newspapers aren't really a thing anymore. I mean, hardly. Um, when's the last time you've picked up a newspaper? Seriously. Yeah. Um, it's, I, yeah. I, I actually think of, like, that's, <laughs> a, that's a crazy thought. Um, the last time I actually picked up a newspaper, it's been maybe like five years, yeah. six years. Yeah, probably me too. Yeah. Um, and so that just shows that the model had, the original model that they had is just gone. I mean, it, re it really I miss is going gone. through those classified ads. I know, right? <laughs> Looking for the new cars and the stuff that I would never buy. That's right. And the, the old Best Buy circulars. Oh, well, and, and you, that's how you got your stock picks. Where you uh, you actually went through the long page of all these stocks. Oh, yeah. Um, it was a while ago. But um, now, I mean, the way I like to talk about them is journalism is just a failed profession. It just doesn't really exist anymore. What we have is editorial. Yeah. We have a lot of editorial. Um, and the editorial could be okay, and sometimes it is actually pretty good, but you really have to search for it, and, and you just can't reliably pick some outlet and say their editorials are good. It just doesn't work that way. You know, the, I, I had a long conversation with someone the other day about this, and movies and journalism and everything else, you know, if we would go back, you know, 30 years, I mean, you, you could argue even today, you had you know, the same 20 actors creating this, the top, the 90% the of volume of movies. And you would have most of the content coming out from the same um, reporters and the same um, uh, journalist. And it was like, you just knew them by their name, right? I remember growing up and just watching Barbara Walters mm -hmm. or, uh, or the, my favorite, uh, in, in Chicago, one of my favorite uh, writers and just, and you would just see the lens of them. And I think the good of what's come out of social media is it's exposed the world that there's a lot of different perspectives and you can, you're not following one or two, you could follow thousands mm -hmm. and really see everything from all different lenses and all different areas and all different perspectives and uh i think that was something that was exciting that happened along the way i do agree um in a lot of regards journalism is dead but i, I feel like it's just mutated mm -hmm. and, and, and it has become to the point because you're not giving these long um long analysis of what's happening in the world but you're you're dealing with a society that needs the quick bite of what's happening and get to the point and and give you know give your references really quickly and therefore total lack of nuance yeah that's pretty dangerous it is yeah i mean it, it, in some regards i i follow some people on other forms of social media and i just uh, what i get excited about is okay so um you know not not pushing ibble but like something that we've been really exploring is the idea that each clip is up to 90 seconds and if you are done with it, you swipe up and move on to something else. But if you want to dig in, you can swipe in and you can put as many references as you want and we're really digging into the reference source. So someone like you and I, we might get curious about something else and then swipe to the end and here's the Wikipedia article and the medical journal and the or the MIT journal and everything else. And so it allows you to be like, cool, I think I got what's happening and you've sparked my curiosity enough for me to dig in. Mm -hmm. But right now what it forces us to do is do that research ourselves. And what this is doing is it's trying to put you in the lens of like, if I'm watching a Robert, Robert Hansen uh, uh, thread, you could follow his thought process and be like, and then here's all my backing and proof and everything you should read if you want to follow my route and yeah, you can leave the platform and go somewhere else. But then also you could watch people spin off the conversation and put their references and their thoughts and their links and everything else. I think that's how I've tried to solve that route, which is how do you condense thoughts and quickly evaluate? Do you want to learn more? Do you not want to learn more? But if you do, let's put them all in a collected area, at least to make the research a little easier. So I agree in a lot of regards journalism has mutated into something else but if used right it, i i believe that 
you could quickly dig in and and understand and and compress that research cycle into something um, much easier to get through a lot more content per day. And this gets back into what we talked about in the beginning. College is the same amount of four years. Well, if I can make um, those four years condensed with more information, if I can make the amount of time that we spend per day doing research condensed that you've digested a lot more information, you're a more rounded person, you have back, bigger background on things, you, you um, can discuss things in more breadth. That's how I... So <clears throat> that's a perfect segue. How do you see... There's lots of different things. Facebook can make someone feel angry. They can make them happy. Yep. I think Ibel could make people smarter um, in a very cool. interesting way. I think by virtue of the fact that you're able to see someone's expression, first of all, you're getting some nuance from them. They put a question mark. Are they being snarky or they really just don't know? Yep. That's a that's a very big difference that you just don't get in text form. And all these platforms are f almost entirely text form or long form, which is another problem. It's hard for people to get through all this very long form content. Yep. Speaking as someone who's doing something long form right this second. Um, but I think there is something about both the ability to spark these conversations. So now you have a thread. This thread is content that is all related to one another. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be more civil because people are, there's attribution. People know who these people are. You've got your names on there, but yeah, your face is on there too. Yeah. <laughs> you can't really ignore that this person is saying this very specific thing because that's that's the way they're saying it. They use some inappropriate language. Are they saying it as a joke or are they, this is what they really feel. And these are very different things. And that nuance is lost. How do you see Ibble's role in helping people get smarter? Like this citation thing is a great example of that. Yeah, that was, um, you know, we had that in one of our pitch decks uh, early on, which was I get really excited about the idea that within one generation or even, you know, a few few years, if I can compress more information and more perspective and more everything, even 10% more into um, someone that's evolving their, their, um, their young brain, they're going to be exposed to so much more information and they're going to come out of this with way more knowledge. And I think, you know, we're not the only ones solving it. Um, I think we've all seen TikTok mutate a lot recently with a lot more learn concepts on there and their blend between edutainment. You're going to see a funny dance video and then a second later you're, you're seeing someone else share some facts about something and then a funny dance video and so on and so on. And so we just go that step further because where it ends is again broadcast mode i've put something out there and it's stopped well how do we learn mm -hmm. we learn we learn in classrooms not by um by listening to the teacher uh they've they figured this out over years the reason why we do tests is it forces us to do homework and prove that we were doing homework because through example and through process we we make what we've heard reality and we sink it into our brains. And so the idea of Ibel of spin off the conversation, give a reference to it. Where this would live on Ibel is all these, you know, 50 different subject matters. We can highlight all the different aspects and we can see, you know, maybe uh, like a SoundCloud, 90% of the audience hate it. Mm -hmm. uh, 90% of this conversation, but 10% of them really circled in on something. And now there's a hot, ticket item that everybody's discussing and now we're seeing all the uh, references and discussions and everything circling about it and then it even allows us to go back into those conversations so like when we forget this conversation we high five each other we go home and have a good night well if this is on nipple a day later um or when this is on nipple a day later we go back in there and see all the spin-off of conversations that have happened and rejoin those points and expand on what we were thinking or hear from our audience of how they were thinking about it. So those are, those are, it's the core of what Ibble is. When I mentioned we started off as an education platform, mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, we, we bring it forward as a great way to have conversations, but we're not just having conversations for the fact of wasting each other's life. We're having conversations to, see each other differently and hear each other differently and learn from each other. And so that's when I say we're an education platform as a core, 
that's that's what I mean by that. I think it's it's just a really powerful way of um, of learning from each other. So something I I don't think I've ever publicly said out loud is that I am extraordinarily dyslexic, mm. like off the charts. Um, I think I took a test. Um, a buddy of mine has a pretty cool app. He was building and he wanted me to beta test it and i got a i think a 27 out of 29 on the dyslexic scale holy like crap. just about as dyslexic as you possibly can be it's have a very difficult time getting through even just a couple sentences it takes it takes a lot of work <clears throat> but my retention is high yep so it makes me smart uh and it makes me delegate a lot to other people to have them read things for me and digest them and give them to me mm -hmm. and podcasts are great because i can hear people without having to sit down and actually try to parse out sentences I, um, I was mentioning to Robert before we started this that I've never seen someone show up. I, if you can see Robert's lap with <laughs> the the biggest layout of a discussion ever. And I was like, we're talking all about that. <laughs> that <laughs> is just like a whole season. <laughs> but it helps. It helps yeah. me get through things. <clears throat> Everyone has their, their method of dealing with their, their way their brain works, but. I've managed to survive okay, except when it comes to social. Yep. Social, I am a mess because when I write things down, it looks one way to me mm -hmm. and then I'll hit enter and then I'll look away and I'll look back and I just immediately spot three errors. I'm like, how did I miss the? I mean, I the words aren't even close. It's not even like in the ballpark of what you might be thinking is the right words. Yep. So how do you enable people to be people and make mistakes like how do you like even ram has error correcting memory yep. you know there the ability for computers to make mistakes shouldn't be discounted if we expect computers to make mistakes how do we deal with humans making mistakes great way so um y your mind and my mind are are similar because how this platform got built is i had someone actually really smart tell me one day they said uh Raymond, I think what you actually built <laughs> was uh, trying to dissect how your mind worked. Like, Ibble's kind of an AI Raymond and an AI team. Like, the different people that work here at, at Ibble, we think about how we solve problems and how we communicate and how we do different things. And and uh, we basically built features around um, that. Much like I said earlier, how do, we, uh, uh, how do we solve events? How do we solve sages? How do we... We just look at what's happening in the, around the world and we we digitize it and so back to your point what we do is when we'll have live functionality coming up shortly but right now everything's asynchronous and it's up to 90 seconds and so um much like dropping a text message well the really cool thing is this conversation could have unpacked instead of a dedicated time like two hours sitting here mm -hmm. it could have unpacked over a two-day period and people that subscribe to the thread could watch this thing much like watching a thread on Reddit unpack. Mm -hmm. And the great thing is because you're confined to 90 second clips, you kind of think of those like chapters. What do you really want to get out? What do you want to share? What references do you want to put there and drop that thought out there? But the really, really exciting thing that happens along the way is because the platform is live, when that content drops, um, your fans can interact. So they questions might come up or they might start spinning off those conversations and you might be thinking of your next video, but what you really should do is you should just wait and listen to how they are interacting because maybe they don't want to hear more. Maybe they want to steer your conversation. Maybe they want to, maybe they want you to pause and come back to something. And so that's a really unique aspect of Ibble versus a normal podcast where we're going for two hours like this mm -hmm. and maybe there was something like hold up hold up hold up i want to let's can we can we expand that if there was a third person in the room this conversation would be way different totally and so um now the other way you can kind of think about it is like let's say you record your 90 seconds and you watch the playback even before you hit post and it is incoherent mm -hmm. you did not hit your aspect at all delete it you know re-record it because it's not live yet or you pushed it live and you went back and looked at it two minutes later and you saw three comments come in. It's not like you're deleting the entire thread. You can just remove that one aspect. And I do it all the time, right? I'll put something up and I'll think about it a minute later. And it's like, that's not the way I want to explain it because I'm seeing the first two comments come in. And I'm like, people are confused. Let's 
let's rewind, right? Because, and that, maybe I have 10 other posts in the thread. Um, I can just delete one and pick it back up where I left off. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of like a, an undo button or redo button that you can uh, go. But, but I thought the, the most important thing about comedians versus a podcast podcasts were focused on each other but a comedian's focused on the crowd yes. and they'll tell a joke and they'll look out in the crowd and then they get a reaction did anybody smile they're hoping <laughs> yeah and if they didn't really good comedians will steer the conversation mm-hmm. and they'll kind of figure out their audience and uh and that's the really exciting thing that you can do with it because it's it's kind of the same aspect you can go and you can explain something or you can move on to something else and see how your fans are interacting and that gives that gives pivotal points along the way and for someone that might be uh you know battling dyslexia or ADHD or or something like that they can condense down their thoughts get something out there and um step away for for a few minutes and they don't have to feel like they're glued glued to the platform so kind of to wind down this thing if you were to say the the top couple of things that you would say you want to do with Ibble over the, you know, next coming year. I know you're, you're released just the United States. Yep. Is that correct still? Yeah, we're going to be, um, uh, fingers crossed, but probably by the time this airs, we'll be available in, uh, Canada and Mexico. And then we're working diligently to get this out into Europe. And, uh, those will be good pause points for us, mm-hmm. much like Ibble, um, <laughs> to go and see how the fins, fans interact and how everything blends and, uh, and then we'll slowly keep on releasing it open, uh, wider and wider. Great. And where can they get it? Uh, it's available on the Android and, uh, Android play store and, uh, Apple, uh, iTunes store. And so, uh, they can download it on either device. Uh, we have plans eventually to, uh, release more stuff on web. You can watch most of the conversations on web right now if you're not in um, the countries that we mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know the really the fun aspect of it becomes really just learning the core idea. We're about conversations. Swipe up to find new stuff. Swipe in to learn more. And uh, if you really want to find something really dedicated, search for it. Find a hashtag. Dig in there. I think the reactions you're going to get, at least on other platforms, probably not Ibble, is bummed that they can't get on Ibble. Uh, so that's probably a good place to be. Yeah, we, um, we, we've we had a lot of people, surprisingly, in Europe, just super excited to be there. And then Canada. I, I didn't realize we had such a big fan base in Canada, but um, we've had people finding other ways to install the app and get out there. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to follow the the rules of what Apple puts out there for us. Of course, of course. Well, thank you very much for doing this. I know that was a kind of a heavy conversation, but you did great. Um, and uh, I hope to have many more of these offline with you. And what we can't do offline, let's do on Hibble. Yeah, this is great. Thank yeah. you so much for, uh, for, for coming in and uh, being the heavy hittest <laughs> <laughs> conversation ever. But I, I think you're going to, have a uh, uh, fantastic conversations in here and uh, we're super happy to have you. Thanks Raymond. Thanks Robert.